An expansion for an Assassin's Creed game usually takes one of two paths. Either continuing the story of the main game with the same protagonist, like Dead Kings or the Hidden Ones, or it will explore a different perspective, which we saw with Jack the Ripper and Freedom Cry. However, Assassin's Creed 3's three-part expansion, The Tyranny of King Washington, didn't do either of these things. It stands out in the Assassin's Creed library for making a different and bold decision. If history was Ubisoft's playground, then they wanted to change the rules. The Tyranny of King Washington tells a what-if scenario, an alternate version of the main game to run alongside its chronology, retelling the events of AC3 under a new context. In this version of events, George Washington obtained a piece of Eden in between sequences 3 and 4 that sends the universe onto a very different path of events, essentially creating a multiverse for Assassin's Creed. Today we're going to be looking at all three episodes of The Tyranny of King Washington and take a look at what happened to Assassin's Creed's first and only attempt to give us an alternate timeline in history. Was it a success? Or was this story best left a fever dream? The thumbnail might give away this answer. With that, let's start off with episode 1, The Infamy. The DLC kicks off with a quote from Lord Action, Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Summarising the message behind this entire DLC, if a little bluntly. We are then treated to a montage of clips showing Connor and George Washington before transitioning to this alternate timeline that we'll be following. Whilst there's nothing wrong with keeping the mystery a secret as to why this alternate timeline is playing out, the actual cutscene in question that we're seeing, chopped up, is not part of the story, it's a side collectible, akin to Assassin's Creed 2's The Truth, which reveals the events that led up to this DLC. So for clarity, let's get that out the way first. Connor is sitting in the forest when George Washington arrives frantically on horseback, revealing that he has been seeing strange dreams from an apple of Eden that he has acquired recently. When Connor goes to grab the apple from him, he is transported into this dream, and that is the context for where this DLC begins. Awakening in the Frontier, Connor is greeted by none other than his mother, Zeo. Considering in the main game that his mother was the driving force for both Connor and Haytham's relationship, having her alive is a fantastic opportunity to have some character interactions. Haytham is still out of the picture in this version of events, which means Connor has grown up entirely without the presence of the assassins. However, we never get to explore this fully as Connor from the main timeline is inhabiting this alternate Connor's body, so we never get to see what an alternate Connor without the assassins would have been like, which I think is a huge missed opportunity. The, the, the outfit is pretty cool though. Connor and Zeo set out to stop a group of patriots, scouring the frontier to look for her. It seems Zeo has stolen something of Washington's that they intend to recover, this acts as a mirror image to the main game, by making Washington's attack on the village because of Zeo, taking a proactive approach and acting to stop Washington instead of in the main game where he attacked out of fear that the Native Americans would start to be proactive. The next section demonstrates Washington's ruthlessness and power, as we see the Patriots burning down the frontier and breaking into homes to try and find Zeo. This quite effectively sets up the sincerity of what Zeo has done, and also the consequences of messing with Washington. When Connor frees the people under attack from Washington's men, they are swiftly killed with a cannonball. Which is really brutal compared to anything we've seen in the main game, and commits to showing a bleaker timeline. Connor is still fully in character, aiming to save the people and being lost for words when they are so quickly slaughtered in front of him. The dialogue hasn't been too fantastic up until this point, as it's all been very expository. 
but you could see this as necessary, when putting us into a completely different world. However, Washington saying this... There she is. Savage that tried to steal the source and symbol of my power. Peace upon it, or it will be the last object you will ever see. I come here to destroy both you and your sad village. But none like you will be allowed to live. Comes across a bit forced and unnecessary, if not to inform the player of why he's here. He also claims to be here to destroy Connor's village, which I would have expected Connor to comment on. How now, he finally has an opportunity to save the village he spent so long trying to protect, and ultimately didn't in the main game. When the conflict dies down, we get an exchange between Zeo and Connor. It seems Connor still hasn't caught on that this is a different timeline, and recalls the events from AC3. But that was not the man I once called my friend. Are you confused? When would you ever have met that monster? I met him. I... Mother, this is all wrong. Washington, the violence, all of it. You can tell that this DLC was either written by different people, or had to hand wave away some parts of the game. Based on Connor's appearance in the forest, I have to assume that this takes place before the sequence where Connor finds out the truth about his village, and could be when Connor walks out on Achilles which could somewhat explain him referring to Washington as his friend, and also why he doesn't seem to recall the fact that Washington already attacked Connor's village. For this dynamic to work, we have to pretend that Connor and Washington were best buds. However, the last exchange we saw between them was this. Enjoy your victory, Commander. It will be the last I deliver you. Returning to their village, Connor and Zeo are met with a new conflict. The Elder, now speaking in fluent English, which is quite an interesting change, speaks of a special tea that can grant them abilities that they can use to fight off the incoming Patriots. Now we'll get to that later, but for now, Zeo refuses to let Connor interact with the tea and instead gives his father's hidden blades, commenting on how Hatham has passed away. This could be a neat way of keeping any Templars out of the expansion, as even Achilles said in the main game that killing off Hatham straight away would cause the Order to scatter, and it also does a nice job of showing what would happen if Hatham never left Zeo for the Templars. I would have actually liked to have seen Hatham in the flesh here, as this was a dream he had thought about in the main game, and it feels cheap to bring it up and then not explore it in any meaningful way. Speaking of which, Washington is already here and attacking Connor's village. Visually seeing Connor defend his village from waves of soldiers does enough to explore this scenario, where Connor would finally have the chance as an adult where he failed as a child to protect his mother. Oh. Zeo is quickly killed off by Washington, leaving Connor in the same scenario he was in to begin with, and suddenly, the game feels like it just missed out on another massive opportunity. The only conversation Connor and Zeo had that wasn't plot related was the line right at the start, where Connor says that things are more than alright now that she's alive. There should have been more time to explore this, whether a darker timeline was worth it for Connor to see and be with his mother again. However, it also poses a much bigger question. In the real world, the Apple of Eden is showing Connor and Washington this dream to give them a scenario in which Washington became king, because it quote-unquote wants Washington to accept the role of king at the end of the expansion. Why does it then show them a scenario that is set in the past? Surely it would change events going forward from their meeting in the forest, and not go back in time to show how things could have been different if he had been king. Because Washington didn't have an opportunity to be king back then, unless the game is suggesting that Washington became king earlier on, when Connor's village was first attacked by him. But then, surely he would recall that this is the same village he burned down 20 years ago. And does this mean that Hatham died protecting the village from Washington in 1765? The DLC never establishes exactly when the timeline has branched off, 
which makes it difficult to see how this expansion could have ever realistically happened. And the apple can't travel through time. My my brain is really starting to hurt. From this point forward, I'm just going to turn my brain off to this massive gaping plot hole and carry on with the plot. Connor is obviously once again unable to save his mother and brutally loses to Washington. Not just knocked out, no no, he's blasted by the apple, a similar blast of which just killed his mother, he's shot twice with flintlock pistols and then impaled with a musket that also shoots him. For good measure. And yet, we cut to five months later, and he's magically fine. I call major bullshit. Connor then begins a journey to the Great Willow Tree, to begin a ritual in the Sky World that will grant him animalistic powers that his brothers from the village have already obtained. And as you can probably imagine, this is where a lot of people are going to lose interest. This is where people are either going to love or hate this expansion, because of the inclusion of animal spirit superpowers. This is essentially Saints Row 4, before Saints Row 4. Climbing the willow tree, Connor retrieves a carving that he can use to create a magical tea. Drinking this tea takes him to the world of the spirits. On the one hand, leaning into the Native American culture sounds like a great thing to do being that this is meant to be a Connor that never joined the Assassins. The following set piece where Connor takes the drugs and goes on a mental trip as a furry is interesting, and it explores the relationship that Iroquois people had with animals. In this case, how they can be expert hunters that move without being seen. Where this loses me is when Connor wakes up, and can now turn invisible and summon magic wolves. And this won't be the case for everyone, I'm sure having these powers for some people will be giving them brand new content that justifies the DLC's existence. I personally just don't see why this was given priority over a interesting retelling of history. As a gameplay mechanic, it is a massive cheat code. Despite draining Connor's health whilst in use, it can be used a long time before it kills him. The wolves also act similarly to the assassin recruits, and can help in combat scenarios, which is a decent substitute. What I like about Connor gaining these powers, however, is how his appearance changes along the way, gaining more tribal tattoos and eventually glowing blue eyes, to show him becoming something supernatural. After completing a somewhat side quest, Connor returns to find the clan mother and the rest of the village survivors have been killed in his absence. This is one of those scenarios where being an alternative timeline gives the writers free reign to kill off anyone they like, and they really don't hold back on this. Connor attempts to rescue the few survivors left in cages throughout the frontier. Upon completing this, he will be knocked out by General Putnam, now a villain working for Washington and taken to a prison in Boston. And this concludes episode one. Slide your head! <laughs> oh yes. You were made for quite a minute. The infamy was sold for $7.99 and offers maybe a few hours of content, but in terms of the story, you'll be there for about the length it takes to get from one objective in Odyssey to the next. It's very short, and yet packs in a lot of story, and just barely makes it across the finish line. Giving only two encounters to use the new wolf abilities makes it feel rather unprepared and undercooked. The alternate timeline never gets a proper chance to be appreciated, because the blockbuster pacing and action-packed first half make it nigh on impossible to take anything on board before something else is thrust your way. Making the second half slower and more methodical was however a good switch-up that allowed you to spend some much-needed time taking in the world with environmental storytelling instead of severe hand-holding and exposition. All in all, the infamy is very messy and leaves much to be desired for episode 2. The Betrayal. 
Carted off to a Boston prison, Connor is reunited with Washington, Benjamin Franklin and General Israel Putnam. It seems that Putnam and Franklin are competing for Washington's favour, so they can own the city of Boston, capturing both Connor and his childhood friend Cannon Dokon as prizes to present to Washington. I love the parallel made here that it was Cannon Dokon that left the village early to seek out Samuel Adams and his... What instantly plays to episode 2's favour is actually that the characters remain similar to their roles in the main game, and having Cannon Dokon be friends with Connor means that there isn't a need for exposition. The two of them easily escape Washington's cell, thanks to Connor's wolf abilities. When Cannon Dokon sees the pouch containing the special tea, Connor has to convince him not to drink it, and I really like this exchange, because Connor doesn't do anything stupid, like telling his friend, oh, I've seen you die before, I don't want to let it happen again. It's not that stereotypical answer, but instead we get this conveyed through his determination not to let him drink the tea, even when his arguments are weak, and Canon Dorkon just kind of picks up on this and gives in. I do think it's quite funny motivation for Connor to, instead of say, oh, it's too dangerous and proven to be ineffective against Washington to risk taking the tea again, instead have Ubisoft point a gun at his back and tell him to give the player another gimmick. And so Connor drinks the tea again and gains the power of the eagle. I didn't mention this for the previous episode, but I will now, that I like how each animal's spirit represents a different gameplay pillar of Assassin's Creed. However, it does completely render them useless. The wolf powers render any social stealth unnecessary, the eagle makes parkour and traversal pointless, and the upcoming bear powers make combat a joke. It serves the purpose of fulfilling a power fantasy, for the expansion, but unfortunately is at the detriment of making all existing mechanics slowly become irrelevant, until by the end, you'll just be tapping a single button for everything. Next we get a chance to use these newly acquired eagle powers, for air assassinations, and a chase scene in which we hunt down Benjamin Franklin, but before we can kill him, this is myself, I've come to myself, my god what have I done? In my plans. Washington actually interrupts the memory corridor sequence to have a virtual battle with Connor. Where did this come from? This is honestly brilliant. It reminds me of a scene in Marvel's What If, when Ultron becomes aware that he's being watched by the narrator. The fact that memory corridor sequences have been built up throughout the series as this kind of pause in time, where the characters can discuss their motivations without interruption, only to have it be interrupted by this godlike figure wielding a piece of Eden, is possibly the only time in this DLC where I found Washington to be an actual threat, and especially having a mental battle with him in an animus simulation was incredible, even if it was just a repeat of his boss battle in episode 1. Upon defeating Washington's projection, the DLC actually treats us to an inner conflict for Connor, as his mother is seen in a vision, berating him for going against her will and giving in to gaining powers. Interesting that this time, Zeo has died being regretful of Connor's decisions, instead of empowering him. Also, we see Washington become aware that his power is slipping away, as if he's aware that this simulation from the Apple of Eden can only last so long, whilst Connor is influencing it by trying to take it off him. Meeting with Samuel Adams and his rebellion, we see a plan get formed on how to undo Washington's work, starting with capturing Franklin and freeing him from the Apple's grip. They learn of a meeting between Putnam and Franklin, in which Connor can get to ahead of time and set an ambush. This allows Connor to get the jump on Franklin, however Putnam is nowhere to be seen, and has stripped Franklin of command, which means that Franklin is completely free for the rebels to use. General Putnam is unable to meet with you. What? Well, this is absurd. Washington will hear of this. King Washington, 
His Majesty has removed himself to New York City to deal with the rebellion festering there. Removed himself? Why wasn't I informed? General Putnam asked me to deliver this proclamation from the King. Whilst Connor is away doing another side quest, Samuel Adams and Canon Dorcon are supposedly killed off screen, and a trap is sprung by Putnam, who for the second time gets the drop on Connor, which is quite impressive. This prompts Connor to hurry and plan his escape to New York. Recruiting Captain Robert Faulkner, Putnam, however, is still in Boston, and as a last-ditch effort to bring Connor to Washington, has kept Canon Dorcon alive as a hostage. However, Samuel Adams has actually been killed. Connor is fortunately able to use his eagle powers to assassinate Putnam, and finally get the better of him. I've done such horrible deeds. It's the scepter, but that's no excuse. Every man holds evil deep within. The apple just brought it out. Canon Dorcon and Connor set their sights on New York for the final battle, with only a special metal key forged by Franklin to aid them, concluding episode two with the site of Washington's Pyramid Fortress. Look at that. The betrayal is a massive improvement from the infamy, choosing to focus on delivering a smaller scale story as the middle chapter, and fleshing out the world Washington rules over and how the people are already planning to fight back. Through Putnam and Franklin, we get to see how the apple can bring out someone's worst insecurities, and this actually does something to inform their characters in the main game. I think that this is the best episode out of the bunch, and maybe doesn't deliver a great what-if plot, but is a well-told story in its own right, that doesn't need to be bombastic or change characters to use them again. Part of me really wishes that it was Charles Lee instead of Benjamin Franklin. However, as the idea of all his power being stripped away and being forced to work not only for Washington, but also for Connor, would have been so humiliating and it would have been tremendously satisfying. Episode 3, The Redemption. The concluding chapter begins with a fun sea battle, that distinguishes itself from the depressing opening chapter of this expansion, by reminding us that fun exists. And we also get a fun nod to Black Flag, with Connor referencing his grandfather Edward. Considering that Black Flag came out only a few months after this expansion, it was exciting to hear at the time, and got the hype going. Once Connor reaches New York, we see Benjamin Franklin has his own superpower, and can keep glasses on his face throughout a ship ramming and a swim to shore. Even he's surprised by this. My spectacles, thank God. He's quickly met by Washington, who tries to kill him before an ambush from Canon Dorcon, who gives his life just for an attempt to kill Washington. However, his efforts are in vain, and he seems to forget that his tomahawk can be thrown immediately after throwing it, and gets shot down before he can crawl towards Washington to land a killing blow. I don't think it's intentional, but it reminds me of how Connor crawled towards Hatham before he killed him, showing how both Ratnagaden and Kanandokon share the same drive and tenacity, even if it could get them killed, which unfortunately this does. I think this is a poor way to start things off. Unfortunately, making Washington appear weak is undoing everything the previous episode did to make him threatening, and killing Canon Dorcon off after already doing a fake out death seems quite cheap. He wanted to atone for what he'd done. He saved my life and very nearly killed Washington. It will take more than a tomahawk. 
This is a very strange interaction. Connor seems to mock Kanan Dokon for even attempting to kill Washington, and doesn't seem to care that he's dead. Compare this with his reaction to his death in the main game, and I think it must be intentional that Connor, like Washington, is becoming absorbed by the power he's being offered. He once again takes the tea, and absorbs the powers of the bear, which as mentioned earlier, changes his eye colour to seem otherworldly. The next section has Connor helping out Thomas Jefferson and his rebels in New York, firstly failing to breach the pyramid and then winning over the favour of the people to build their numbers for a second attempt. This second attempt works, as Connor has proven to be a man of the people and the best representative for freedom and equality, and so people quickly rally to his cause to lead an assault on Washington's pyramid. Citizens. As I stand here, I feel the four million hearts of our nation beating within my breast. Today, I announce the great project of this nation. We are mastering vast armies. We are fashioning powerful armadas. We shall soon march upon our great dark enemy, England! We shall invade her shores and irrigate her fields with blood. English bones shall provide grist for her mills, and her people shall become our slaves. Each of you shall profit from the sweat of their labors. Our nation shall rise to its proper place as the greatest of all, the most sovereign kingdom, the United States of America. Yeah, remember when I said in the last video that Charles Lee had thin motivation? This is just straight up no motivation, other than the piece of Eden being a MacGuffin that makes him evil, and I don't even think they're trying to hide it. Man just hates Brits. As Connor makes his way through Washington's pyramid, we get flashbacks showing how Zeo was able to steal the apple from him in the first place. Whilst this is the catalyst that set off this story, it's not one I think needed visually seeing, and just adds to pad out the runtime. The pyramid is honestly very underwhelming for the fortress that it looked like from afar. It's a lot of big empty rooms and incomplete areas, that are big in scale, but don't have anything in them that looks remotely interesting apart from the zoo, and it ends up feeling like a massive warehouse more than a palace. When Connor reaches the top, we get an exchange which implies further that Connor would not destroy the apple, but instead use it for his own goals, which are never truly defined, only vaguely thought out by Connor, but something the apple would exploit in him. You wish the apple for yourself so you can control the nation. The true rulers are the people. Let's not deceive ourselves. It's an absurd thought, but let's suppose that I were beholden to this apple. How would you behave differently? I would use it for the good of everyone. Well, the possession of the apple is both a burden and a blessing. Tell me, when you shake the earth, you feel that you are a slave to the people. Or do you wish to be their master? The people want you brought down. But you didn't answer the question. I am the only king here! <laughs> Washington sees his lust for power and claims that Connor is no better than he is, much akin to how Charles Lee was no different from Washington. Once again, another massive missed opportunity to use Charles Lee. Why not bring more attention to the fact that Connor was becoming like him. That's gotta hurt. <laughs> After the battle with Washington, Connor crawls towards the apple and is met by projections of the characters he's met in the story. 
firstly Kanandokon and then his mother Zeo, both pleading with him not to take the apple, before a vision of himself from the main timeline tells him to take it. It appears as if the apple is trying to manipulate Connor into thinking the ones he loves are wrong, and that no matter how much they claim that he's gone astray, his original self would agree that he's in the right. I've just now thought of a really interesting little detail they could have put in. What if when it, we see the original Connor, it like kind of glitched a little bit and switched to Charles Lee? Just for like a brief second, I think that would have really like... I don't know, I feel like Charles Lee needs some presence in this. The idea of taking a character that represented the best of humanity and bringing him down to become a villainous figure is an incredibly interesting idea, however doing it takes time, and it won't come in only a few hours, and unfortunately Connor doesn't feel like he's changed enough to make this sudden switch feel natural. Upon grabbing the apple, the two are transported out of the dream, and back to reality, where Connor tells Washington, No man should possess a power so absolute which is completely in tune with his character from the main timeline, and makes the question posed a few seconds ago of whether he would use it for himself completely redundant and gone back on. The DLC ends with Connor and Washington being on, I, I don't know, maybe good terms, maybe bad terms. I'm really not sure, since I don't know when this takes place in the story, it's left vague enough that it could go either way. We see Washington give a pretty good speech on why he won't be accepting the role as King of America, whilst Connor buries the apple at sea forever, tying everything up quite nicely. The redemption feels very short, and rushed to quickly reach an ending. The content seems to have dried up for this entry, because it feels like very little happens. The most eventful moment is Kanandokon's assassination attempt on Washington, and then you may as well skip to the end to see the fight on top of the pyramid, as it's all a very short amount of filler to get to that point. To summarise my thoughts, is this the worst Assassin's Creed DLC? Well, it sure is a mess. Episode 1 is so rushed and brutally depressing that it leaves a bitter taste throughout the rest of the entries. Episode 2 is honestly a decent bit of content, but then Episode 3 tries to stick the landing by doing nothing making the plot feel very front-loaded and the gameplay an afterthought. The DLC never takes advantage of its premise, or characters, and devolves down to a basic plot with a thin motivation for its villains that all chalk up to a very uninteresting set of events. The DLC appears to not affect the characters at all, since their beliefs are the same from beginning to end, despite the expansion's best efforts to make them question it. When you consider as well that while all three episodes are free on the Assassin's Creed 3 remaster, in 2013 these were roughly £24 altogether for a roughly 4 hour DLC, not including side content of which there's maybe a few extra hours on top. Compared to Freedom Cry, which I previously stated was my favourite DLC, that was 4 hours of content, but with 5 to 10 hours of side content which was priced at a third of the tyranny of King Washington, and offered a much more complex narrative and interesting characters. It is, unfortunately, a case of massive wasted potential, and uncertainty of what the team could and couldn't do. These days, I think the DLC would have actually worked much better, because it would have leaned so much further into the fantasy aspect of the animal powers, and less of the alternate timeline stuff, and produced at the least a more entertaining experience than the bleak one we got. However, it definitely sowed the seeds for things like the Fate of Atlantis and the Dawn of Ragnarok expansions in later titles, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but even Odyssey did that simulation thing better. It leaves the tyranny of King Washington as a product of its time, and I do think should be remembered as a bold experiment that unfortunately didn't quite work out.